I wonder if you would give me a finish lesson while we wait for late comers or stragglers to come in. So, and if you don't mind, for my future reference, I'll record it. So hold on, give me one moment. Any of you speak Finnish? Uh, a bit? So, <laughs> uh, how do you do this? How does one do this? Right, okay. So I've always been curious how you say no in Finnish. So I was wondering if I could record you guys telling me, just as a group, so on three. Uh, right, so you're gonna say no to me in Finnish. Oh, hold on, wait, I don't know how to do this. Wait. All right, you uh, Okay, so how do you say no in Finnish? Is it is it a or a? <laughs> it's it's a a. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's uh, I will remember how to use that. Um, so. It looks like, I mean, that's good, right? We've given them two minutes, late people. Who's this? <laughs> How are you guys doing? Who, anybody sleep last night? No. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, see, I'm learning. Uh, now, what did you do if you didn't sleep? Try, was it too hot? Hey, <laughs> wait, yo, uh, okay. No, not, I don't want anything gory. Remember, I'm here, I'm gonna go home and tell all these stories, so just imagine what I'm gonna tell people when I go home. Uh, anybody play any good games last night? Good games, good games? Hey. <laughs> Anybody play any bad games last night? Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, I find I learn a lot from bad con games. Did anybody run a bad game last night? Would anybody admit to that? Anybody admit to running a bad game last night? I didn't think so. <laughs> Has anyone ever run a bad game? Uh, <laughs> okay. I run them every week. <laughs> All right, I think that's good. I think, I think we have been amply polite. We've been three minutes polite. We can get started. Uh, so my name is Luke. Uh, I make games, and I have been making games since 2002, and I, uh, I've also done other things since 2002. So I thought that it would be interesting Maybe, and you guys can tell me. I've never done this before. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about how I make games, um, and uh, not, not so much why, but more process. Uh, so yes, the, the title of the panel, uh, how do you design a book, uh, <laughs> design and publish right, without killing yourself. Um, does anyone here, is anyone here interested in creating games or publishing games? Yeah, great. That's right, you keep your hand down, you know better. <laughs> Uh, oh wait, I need my clicker, I need my clicker. This thing is amazing. You guys have serious presentation technology here. I would love it. Uh, all right, so this guy. So yeah, it's Stephen King, he wrote a book uh, about writing books, uh, very famously called On Writing. It's very authorial, um, right? But look at that. He, so, Stephen King, he's a, he is a machine, he's a writing machine, he has written a billion books in uh, I don't know how many words, but you know, so he, he writes one to two thousand words a day. So, but, so I, I read this and I wondered how many, how many words do I write a day? But then I started thinking about other things, like there's so much to do <laughs> aside from writing and so so much it's like they're very important things to do like, you know like it's i have a, a lot in my day is very packed very very packed uh 
I, you know, my nights too, not a lot of time at night. This is not me, by the way, this is my friend Jason. But, you know, we must rock, often. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not writing at this show, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, I also happen to have a job, which is great, a job. I have not had a job. That is less great, having a job, great. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I work uh, from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, and I, my job is one of those jobs where I don't have to work 24 hours a day, but I have to sort of be on call all the time for, you know, I, you wouldn't believe how many Kickstarter emergencies there are. It's ridiculous. Uh, so, but I, I really like things like a salary and uh, healthcare. We don't get healthcare unless we work in America. There's a really big incentive system there. Uh, so, so yeah, not not a lot of time for writing during the day. And then also at night when I'm not at the rock shows, there's a lot of Dungeons and Dragons to play. You know, there's like so much to do. This is one of my Kickstarter D&D groups actually. I have three D&D groups at Kickstarter in addition to my two home groups. Do you do the math about how many nights a week that's gaming right there? Uh, and then I also throw events. This is actually a convention I run uh, in New York City. I showed this slide yesterday, but these are 30 of my closest friends. Uh, these are people that traveled from all over uh, to come to Burning Con in New York. Uh, I go to a lot of other conventions. I spend a lot of time on the internet, you know. This is, a, you know, there's a lot to do. I have to answer all your questions on the forums. So many questions. And G+, I love G+. Does anybody use G+, here? Yeah? A, uh, <laughs> yo, uh, I love G+. So, turns out, I'm well below Mr. King's mark. Well, I don't, I'm not here to smear him. He actually wrote on writing, uh, I think it as a reflection on his cocaine years, like as kind of a like expiation of his uh, alcohol and drugs and to basically say like, this is how I did it, don't, don't do it like I did it. But I don't know, whatever. But he still wrote a lot of books and people seem to like them. Um, so yeah, not, not 1,000 or 2,000 words a day. Uh, 306 words a day. So what does that mean? Well, turns out it's actually not so bad. 15 titles uh, in, I mean, it's 2014 now, 14 years. Um, 306 words a day. I really, really, really want to know what the fuck was going on in 2008 and 2010. This, the, this, and you know what's not there in 2010? The Mouse Guard box set as well. Uh, I, because I felt guilty, but um, what was I doing? I was not doing cocaine in 2010. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know what I was on. Uh, I mean, some of these are smaller. Like, this is a 96 page pamphlet. This is probably a 48 page pamphlet. This is 100 pages. This is 200 pages. Um, but these are two book sets, and <laughs> this, is, this is a monster. Uh, you know, there's, so even just writing something, you know, as simple as, uh, 306 words a day, it actually starts to add up over time. Uh, it's a lot of pages. I mean, you've seen, some of you have seen my books, it's just, that's what's going on in there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I feel like, fuck you, Mr. King. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got a finished chuckle. I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, let's just give you guys some context there about um, what I do and uh, and uh, who I am. And then I thought, now that you you know you know what I'm capable of, um, we would uh, talk about actual process, uh, writing process. So no more jokes, very serious from here on out. Very, very serious, very artistic, very serious. Um, so when I am, uh, when I'm writing, or this, is, this isn't even writing, this is before writing. When, uh, I, I always make goals for myself. Uh, and 
Right, these are, these are things that I've learned to express. I mean, these are things I've always done, but I didn't know how to talk about them until recently. So when, when, I, my, when I started out, my initial, like, my big goal was I want to make games. My mini goal was twofold. Figure out how to make games uh, and figure out also, <laughs> it, big, big goals, uh, but figure out uh, also the, the, the technical process of making games. I taught myself um, all the layout, all of the, the um, production of the games. Uh, like everything, any of my games that goes to press, like I have created that file. I have created the book, I've created the layout. I do all that work myself. I don't do any of the art because I don't actually have any talent. Uh, no. <laughs> What's it? Uh, yeah, I try. I tried. Um, so, so uh, you know, I realized very early on that uh, I, I needed to learn some skills, and um, so this, you know, this is one of the the first publications that I ever created, it was at a copy shop. This is actually, if the, you guys saw my presentation yesterday, this one predates the, uh, the one that I showed yesterday. Um, and uh, it's very bad. The layout inside of it is horrible. Uh, I'm not going to show it to you because it's embarrassing. Uh, the rules are terrible. Uh, but they're, you know, but it was the first step on this journey, uh, you know, with this very long-term journey. Um, but one of, the, one of the things just, uh, the, the last one there is never say forever. Uh, as soon as you, you set a goal and say, I want to do this goal because this is something I want to do forever, you're fucking yourself. <laughs> you're just like putting this huge weight on your shoulders because when you're feeling bad or when it's hard, or, you know, or, or when, yeah, you've, you've kind of maybe taken the wrong path for a, a moment and suddenly you have the weight of forever sitting on your shoulders like, oh, I have to do this, for, like this is my goal to do this forever. Oh, Don't, so never, like just, kind of ignore that part and say like, hey, I'd like to do this thing, I'd like to make games, and so I will figure out, you know, the steps I need to, to make games. I will figure out how to do layout, I will figure out how to actually write. <laughs> uh, so yeah, never say forever. Uh, this is also an early step in the process. This is one of the first documented sessions of probably Burning Wheel. Um, those are my very young friends. For those of you who were here yesterday in my presentation, that's the guy. That's him, my frenemy. Uh, <laughs> all right. So once you have your goal, and once you're, you know, you you have, you know, or have your mini goals, really. Uh, what I do is I, I start concepting. Um, I take notes. I test things, and I refine them uh, at like at a very very simple level. At a you know, I am I'm always carrying a notebook with me, uh, and always carrying a pen. If any of you ask me for a sign signing, you know that I've hold out my own pen because um, it's just if, you, if you're really committed to this, if you really want to write and publish uh, your, your stuff, you just have to be ready at all times to have that idea and set that idea down. So whatever it is, I mean, you're, if you're going to do this, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a notebook, but you know, it could be a recorder or something like that. But um, you like this, these like very like blocky, broad, uh, ideas that you know very rough uncut things they have to be taken down and then you have to talk to your your friends you have to talk to your associates about them you have to uh, you know test them and refine them even like something as simple as uh, if I have an idea you know and I, I take some notes on it and I'm feeling good about it and I pitch it to you and I say what do you think about this and you're like you know that tells me something it tells me I'm not either I'm not communicating it correctly or it's a bad idea or something along those lines uh, so just like e even that level of um, interaction at the concepting phase is really important keep going all right so uh, I I believe I'm probably wrong but I, I believe that at my heart I am a practical man <laughs> And uh, so there, I have developed certain tools that I use. As I noted, uh, my notebook and my black pen are my constant companions. And um, but there are other tools that are uh, uh, are very, very, very important to me. And, and uh, like, this is what's comfortable to me. Uh, there's no really right way to do this. There's no correct set of tools for writing or, or publishing or anything like that. Uh, you've got to find what what helps you. Um, but 
for those of you who know uh, InDesign, the uh, I write in InDesign. Like once I get past the like very early like drafting stage, I'll, I'll do I'll draft in in text editor. What is that cursor doing there? Good, damn it. Um, no, no, oh God. Um, I I will draft in a text editor, just a very basic, uh, you know, with no formatting, just to kind of blah. I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll transcribe my notes. I'll take my notes and just blah, just type them all in, so that I can begin formatting them. And then once I can, once I have a document that I can no longer kind of conceive of in my head, once I I can't. Like I have a text document that's just so long and, and horribly formatted that I can't make sense of it anymore. Then I take it into InDesign and I just do everything else in InDesign and I just write, write, write. InDesign is a layout program and this is a horrible idea. Writing, on in, writing in InDesign is the worst possible thing you could do, but I do it anyway. Uh, but two of my other tools uh, that I have learned, I've had to really, like th those are kind of intuitive. The two non-intuitive tools are the two, like, productivity tools, we call them. Uh, my calendar and my Trello. I'll show you Trello. We'll get to the calendar in a minute. Uh, but keeping a calendar, very important for keeping goals. Uh, but this is Trello. Uh, so I, I hate these things. I hate their, like, productivity or time management or, uh, like, adding any of this stuff. I fucking hate them. Uh, but recently, uh, we started using this stupid thing at work, and I said, you know, maybe this would work. Uh, our, we had so many projects and so much going on uh, at Burning Well headquarters that I couldn't, it was, I got to the point where I, like, keeping it notes in my, in, my, in my notebook about what had to be done was just ridiculous. They were just getting lost. So this stupid thing, it's so good. You can make checklists and set due dates and have leave notes and comments and everybody gets emails and you have all these lists of things that need to be done and oh, it's so good. But the best thing about this by far was teaching myself how to be organized, teaching myself how to communicate better with the people I was working with. And this, the blowout window here, um, is me working with an artist, working with my favorite artist, Jordan Worley, it's for the artist for uh, the art for inheritance. And so I said to Jordan, I said, "Hey, would you join this stupid productivity tool web thing for me and try it out with me?" And he said, "Sure." Uh, and so now, instead of having these epic email chains with sketches and drafts and fi final art and uh, links and stuff, I don't know where anything fucking is. Uh, we just have this board uh, where Jordan posts the art. Uh, or he'll post a link and I get an update and it's only me, even though, you know, Topi's on the board and Tor's on the board and, uh, you know, all my, all my other collaborators are on the board, you can very specifically narrow it down to who, you know, who's actually involved in this project. And so now I get updates and then, you know, everything is where it should be. I can look at all the beautiful art and he can, you know, there's a, a card for each uh, particular thing. And this has like, it's been like clouds parting for me uh, because, Making this making this easier, commissioning art and dealing with art makes means I have more time to write, and I never have enough time to write. I could go back to the initial slides and show you. I, I never have enough time to write. Anyway, so one of the other things that I have learned, uh, and this this is so weird to say, but this is I've learned that busy work is so important. Learning how to do busy work and just committing to it and embracing the busy work of writing. Writing is not all glory. Writing is not all Mr. Stephen King, you know, with his legs up and, you know, writing in his beautiful notebook or whatever. It's so much bullshit uh, involved in writing. And as soon, the sooner you realize that, uh, the better you're going to become at this. The, um, and so, I mean, editing, layout, spreadsheets, and <laughs> I, I know this is ridiculous, but I found like a mnemonic trick when I am, um, when I'm stuck, uh, if I just alphabetize a list, it'll help me remember where I was in the process, like what chat, what I was writing about in the chapter or something like that. And if those of you who played my games, there's so many lists. Uh, so much alphabetizing, and uh, you also know that I often get it wrong uh, because I change the as I alphabetize things, I will change the names of them and then not move them in the alphabetized order. It's great. Anyway, <laughs> it's fucking. <laughs> so this is a spreadsheet for the art commissions for Torchbearer, and this hurt. The blue means that uh, it's all turned in, good, done. 
like, you know, we blew them out as we went. Uh, but you can see Kurt and Russ Nicholson, uh, Peter Mullen for the cover, Richard Lushek, Jen Rogers, Chris Moeller. Uh, but this is a tool for creativity. Uh, you, I mean, it's hard to believe, but doing this and, and um, making sure this was organized and getting this, uh, this taken care of and keeping it, in, you know, keep, keeping it tight meant that I had more time to write and also just help me remember like the layout of the book, right? It helped me say, oh, we need art for this, art for that. Uh, and, and then once I started thinking about those chapters, I said, oh, wait, is that section of that chapter done? Do I, you know, do I need to write an example for that chapter? And it just helped kind of walk me back into the, the um, you know, into the project after I was out at a rock show, for example. Uh, and then w w another thing that I, I'm kind of obsessive about is that, so this is me in maybe, I don't know, two, this might be 2001, 2002. Um, this is me with a printout of the original draft of Burning Wheel at my ancient computer. Uh, editing it, I, I just like again. This is a creative process for me. Reading what I've written, going over it, revising it, refining it, and just constantly trying to um, to understand what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but editing again, it's a creative process for me. It helps me remember where I was uh, in the writing and helps me get back to where I need to be. Um, so, yeah. So rock shows and afternoon bike rides. Uh, so it's really, so if, if you're going to be a writer, so in addition to like embracing this busy work of writing and, and uh, the, the other thing that you have to really be honest about are distractions. We live in a wonderful world of fabulous things to do. And uh, as soon as you start writing, you will realize that all of those things are better than writing. Every possible thing. You know what? Raking the lawn is better than writing. You know why? You get outside, you get a little exercise, and you can finish it. It'll be done. <laughs> you can rake the lawn in, in an afternoon and be done. You can't write anything in an afternoon and be done. Uh, I mean, unless you're like signing your name. Uh, so, to, so just be honest with yourself about your distractions and uh, you know what they are like. You kind of just have to acknowledge your demons, uh, and that'll help you say, like, okay, what I'm doing here, you know, maybe, maybe beating XCOM again isn't completely necessary. I think I beat it four times. Anybody play XCOM, by the way? Anybody? Yes. This this is a sublime thing to me. This the plasma sniper and the archangel armor is just oh yeah. Oh man, I just I just have a game like that's right now that's right before the end, like right before the final mission that I just go in and do a mission once in a while just because I like to boom those plasma sniper rifles. Anyway, but but by but I know this is a distraction and like just having that voice of conscience in my head and recognizing it as a distraction, I can say maybe I should just finish the chapter first before I go sit down. Um, but just to go back. So I, you know, I, I'm going to preach some heresy here. Um, I, I know it is basically like you could probably burn me at a stake for saying these things because of our, you know, our lovely gamer culture. But uh, you got to treat yourself right when you're writing. You're, you're, you, if you're eating shit and and you know pounding coffee will burn you out. Um, if you're going on a long haul, if you're trying to write a book, I mean, you can ask. Mr. King, I'm sure he started with cigarettes and coffee, and you know, I'm not saying that they're the gateway drug, but like, yeah, I'm not. It's the, <laughs> all right, maybe I am. Just treat yourself right while you're doing it. It's going to be a long fucking haul uh, when you're writing something, and uh, and despite what you think, pounding coffee all night is only going to hurt you in the long run. <laughs> so you know, use it when you need it. I'm not saying don't do it. Uh, but just treat yourself right, uh, and uh, and it'll help you by doing this. It'll like <laughs> when you're not tweaking on caffeine, you'll actually be able to focus better and uh, not have to play XCOM in order to fall asleep, like me. Uh, so, oh, hello, there he is again. All right. So yet another vital skill. Then, as we kind of drill down through all of this, 
uh, are to set your deadline. So it's one thing to have goals, it's one thing to have a concept for a game, and it's one thing to be like, have your spreadsheets and your productivity tools. None of that matters unless you have a deadline. Because I know from my experience, I will faff about forever without a deadline. I will tweak things. I, I will take complete, complete ownership of the um, Mouse Guard Second Edition. Like I will, I will tweak that game forever. I submitted. I so far I've submitted the file for, for the Mouse Guard, the the new Mouse Guard Second Edition, three times so far because I keep going back and making changes because there's no deadline because the publishers like. They keep pushing things off, so I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go, I'll fix that, I'll fix that. Anyway, so deadlines, uh, nothing is ever going to be done uh, when you're writing. So just abandon that. A abandon perfection, abandon completion. Things that you will hit your deadline and you will have to let it go and you will have to just turn away and be like, I don't know, you read it, I can't read it anymore. Um, but uh, the, um, they're vital. You will just, like, without a deadline, um, you will just, you'll keep working on it forever, and that's not what you want. You want to finish the thing and work on the next thing, especially since it's never going to be perfect. But, so, here you go. This, <laughs> this is, these are my insane deadlines. So, uh, in the U.S., there's a convention called Gen Con. Uh, it's the biggest tabletop gaming convention in the States, uh, and this is August 2008. So, uh, August 13th, 2008, uh, I'm missing one of my favorite bands <laughs> uh, to go to Gen Con, but, and you'll see here, Magic Burner printing ends. So, <laughs> so Magic Burner printing comes in on the 11th for uh, Gen Con on the 13th, and we had it there. We had it for that show. Um, and how do we do that? The absolute spell casting sorcery. Uh, the way we set this deadline was we said, okay, if we need it by August 13th, how long does it take to print? It's going to take six weeks to print. So if it takes six weeks to print, when do we need it to the printer? We need it to the printer uh, in June. So what does that mean? That means we need to have final layout done by mid-June and be ready to do final editing pass. So what does that mean? Final layout means that we need uh, to have the first round of editing done beginning of June. That means we need all the. Uh, we also need all the art commissions coming in through May and April, which means we need all the playtesting and writing done uh, in March and February, which means we need to be uh, concepting and drafting in uh, January and December. Oh fuck! It's you know <laughs> it's January. Uh, you, you know we better get started. Like that's that's how I do my deadlines is that I say like, okay, when do I absolutely have to have this? And by committing to basically, you know, Gen Con or like something that's fixed and hard where I have to have it done, um, you know, it helps me uh, really stick to it. You know, and if you blow a deadline, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, it's not, don't kill yourself because you blew a deadline, but, um, but they, it, it, it's, it's the only way to fly. So, so right, so while you're on deadline, that's one of the really beautiful things that I found about this process, like, I, I don't know if you've ever had, actually, so just to back up, I don't know if you've ever had this, this fear that you're only ever going to have one good idea, that you've got this really good idea, and just like, oh, God, I don't know, like, I, I don't know, I don't, will I ever have an idea as good as this? And the answer is yes. You're going to have ideas that are a thousand times better than that idea. Um, as, and they are going to come while you're working on this idea. And in fact, you're going to realize that they're probably better, and, you, and you're going to say, wow, this idea that I'm working on sucks, and let me, you know, work on this other new idea, because it's better. Don't do this. Don't do this to yourself. Don't be me. This is, this is sitting on my hard drive. This is a cover to a, a game that I want to write, uh, but I'm, I was in the middle of Torchbearer when I had this idea, and so I, you know, I have the, a, a bit of a luxury here. I commissioned a cover for it in order to satisfy the urge to turn and work on it. But it's still sitting there on my hard drive. Um, and uh, I really want to go back and work on it. And I have absolutely no time uh, because, uh, you know, I had to focus on Torchbearer. And then Torchbearer comes out. I needed a fucking break. But, uh, you know, I also had to focus on the materials for Torchbearer that came out, the cards, and now the GM screen. And now I need to get Mouse Guard Second Edition out. You know, so like it's it's heartbreaking to me but you, you know you'll have all these ideas and it's good set them aside in your uh, on your hard drive or in your files 
and come back to them in the future. They'll always be there, especially if you're taking notes and you're concepting, they're in your notebooks, uh, and um, you know, you're not gonna lose them, you're not gonna forget them, and honestly, you'll probably think of a better idea than this one, too. Uh, <laughs> all right, and then, so, there's a skill to this that I have had to teach myself uh, to, to get through the deadlines, uh, to get through the focus, and that's to learn how to say no. Um, I mean, and it's really, it's heartbreaking, uh, but uh, there's me saying no to my dearest friend. Uh, so, like, like, writing is your job. Uh, once you've committed, once you're this far down the line, don't, you know, don't fuck it up. <laughs> Uh, just what I have, what I've learned is that the the eight months or six months or a year that you're writing on this project and you're dedicated to it and you're you know you're um, you know you're you're staying in in the evenings you're um, you know you're saying that you can't go to brunch on uh, you know on Saturdays that ends and what it ends with is you finishing a beautiful thing you 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 know you accomplishing this amazing task. And then you go out, then you celebrate, then you take everybody out and say, sorry, I was busy. Um, you know, you, or you take your kids to the park and say, uh, I'm, I'm a good daddy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but making, like, uh, learning how to like say no and saying, I'm sorry, I can't, like, uh, or, and learning how to not answer the phone or, and, not, and how to not leave the house, it's a skill. It's a real, it's a tragic, horrible skill of being a writer. You, it, writer's an incredibly lonely profession. Uh, so to counteract that, uh, there's a, a couple things. Um, it, you know, I, I'm not advocating that you become a monk and you know journey to Lindisfarne and illuminate your manuscripts. Uh, just focus, uh, but also reward yourself in the process as you go. My rewards are very, very simple. Um, my rewards are like taking myself out to breakfast by myself, um, uh, just because I was up late last night working or something like that. But just simple things like that where, you, where you're, you know, you, you work hard, you reward yourself, you buy yourself something nice, you let yourself play a little XCOM, uh, or, you know, just something taking, going out to your favorite restaurant, it really helps. Um, because again, writing is lonely and hard and it sucks. Um, and the other side of counteracting that, uh, aside from rewarding yourself, is associate uh, while you're writing. So find people that aren't going to, going to necessarily distract you, but find people that are going to engage with you about what you're doing. Find collaborators, find other designers or other players, or you know, this is specifically about games, but um, find people who will look over your shoulder and read and give you constructive comments rather than, you know, hate uh, or, um, or bullshit, but uh, these are some of my friends uh, in New York. You know, that's, that's uh, my editor, and this is, I don't know, he's my curmudgeon. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine, he play tests all my games. Um, I, you know, Topi's here too, this guy, he's, uh, he is with me in New York too, and, and having this, like, having associates that are interested in what I'm doing, but um, understand when I can't come out or you know I say no, uh, I have to fucking sit and write. But they're also they're willing to read, they're willing to come over and test. It really uh, lessens the blow. So yeah, I'm I'm not saying become a hermit. Uh, fuck Stephen King. Uh, don't don't spend two thousand. Uh, don't spend all of your days writing two thousand words. Just uh, balance things um, and try to find your center. So, and the last thing that you do as a writer, the absolute final thing, is that you write. It is the probably, you know, it is the most, most important and least important thing at the same time. So how do you write? I don't know. Uh, but uh, there's a few things, um, like w when, I, when I sit down to write something, it's like I can feel it, it's like a physical pressure in me that, you know, I have to get this idea out. I really, like sometimes it's in my head or sometimes it's in my throat where I just feel like I have to, to try to make sense of this idea and put it on the page. Uh, so, and I have found a, a, a couple truths for me. One is that I need a space to write, and you, you hear writers say this all the time, and it's just, I think it's true, whether it's you're at the cafe, uh, or whether you're, you know, a place in your house. Uh, for me, you know, I have my bedroom set up very specifically so I can, you know, uh, have a writing desk and, and uh, sit and write. And, 
Uh, but having that space where you know this is the place where I go to write, uh, it'll help. It'll build a habit in you. And then when I'm stuck and, not, and I don't want to do any busy work and I hate my project, it's the worst thing in the world, uh, and I just I don't want to write anymore and I'm tired, I have a migraine, uh, I've found that if I write one word that day, I'm, I'm serious. This isn't like a aspirational thing, write one word. No, this is me going, writing fuck you, like <laughs> Luke. <laughs> so like, or, you know, or just, um, or, you know, or sometimes I'll just write like rules, rules go here. Like just anything, just getting, like for me, just, just breaking through that barrier when I feel like I can't write anymore or don't want to write that day, just writing one single thing down uh, you know, in the, the document or in my notebook uh, will help me. And even if, it, even if that's all I do that day, it's going to help me tomorrow uh, or it's going to um, you know, help me in the future. And the, uh, the last thing is that writing is, a, um, is an exercise like fencing or... Uh, you know, like a like a martial art. Like you have to stay warm. Uh, you you have like your brain is a is a is a is a muscle, uh, and it needs to be tuned, and it needs to uh, you know you, you need to stretch, and and then once it's warm, you got to keep it going. It's uh, I if I write something one month, if I'm very much into a game, and then I have events, 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 and shows and distractions, and I come back to it in a month, I pretty much have to start over. I have to like I will take things and just rewrite the whole thing because I have no fucking idea where I was or what I was doing because I've lost the thread. You know, my I, I, my brain is cooled down. Uh, I hate it. Uh, somebody's like I I was working on a game I don't know, a year and a half ago and someone's come back to me and asked me to keep to pick it up again and work on it again with them. And I'm like I have the document. We did a ton of work on it, but I don't. I'm gonna have to start over. Uh, uh, so like this this is why like. This is why you should be making sacrifices. You know why you should be cutting out the distractions is because your writing will be better for it if you're if you're warm. You know if you're working on it a little bit every day. If you're you're staying on point, uh, it's just it, it's just kind of how uh, we work as biological machines. Uh, so yeah, so keep keep your brain warm. This and this is me at the end of writing the adventure burner, um, yelling at my roommate or something. Those are this is these are edited pages of me just throwing edited pages on the, on the ground. So and there I am buried uh, in my work. So uh, yeah, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Oh, right, microphone, sorry, catch box, Ropicon, woo! Hi, uh, thank you. The headline of the presentation was something like writing two books a year without going insane. Yeah. So given all of this sacrifice that you have to do, how do you write two books a year and not go insane? Oh, you don't, that's the joke. You, <laughs> you're thank you. crazy if you write. Um, you're a crazy person. Uh, you, well, that's the, that's the thing is you, you're, you're one of, you're going to have to strike a balance. There are going to be distractions. You are going to get tired. Uh, you, but you don't have to spend all day every day. I'm saying, like, I have done all of this while ho holding down jobs, relationships, uh, you know, uh, going out and having a life, uh, coming here to visit you guys. So just writing a little bit every day, just you know, that one word, or you know, or just making sure that you have a day to yourself on the weekend um, if you're not. You know, maybe you only write a few times during the week, but you know, Saturday you spend, uh, you know, working on your things. Like just, just a little bit. Remember, like I am, you know, one third of Stephen King's output at best. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to be him in order to do all this stuff. Just a steady, gentle pressure uh, over years, and you can produce all these ridiculous books. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh. Uh, We'll pass it up there, and we'll come back to you. Just okay. So um, you've done a lot of research for Burning Wheel, I guess. A little based, bit based on the bibliography. Uh, did you do it uh, prior to the design or during your writing process? That's a good. I, that's a good question. Um, both. I, I will usually for a game. I look for what we call the ur text, like for Burning Wheel is the Silmarillion and. Um, 
uh, Barbara Chuckman's A Distant Mirror. Like those are their two ur texts for Burning Wheel. And um, if I, and that, usually those texts will inspire me to write the game. Uh, for, and, and then for additional material, like I read a bunch of Desmond Seward stuff uh, and just other historical books and obviously just, you know, had a history and fantasy. Uh, but I would read I would read them as we went and then refine um, as we went. Uh, as, but as long as I have that ur text, like that the really like the text that I'm really drawing from uh, as an inspiration, um, I'm good. I'm good to start the design. Like I usually can't really start a design without one. And if there's a game that you want me to design, it's probably because I haven't and if I haven't done it, it's, I haven't found the text. Like uh, for example, like Apocalyptica, it's very difficult to find the like core. Like like biblical level texts like the Silmarillion for uh, Apocalyptica, so I don't. Uh, it's very hard for me to design in that space. Like it, I, I have a stack of those books, but I don't have one of them that I really like. Uh, but yeah, I do both. I, I start with something and then I uh, I keep researching as I go. Uh, so pass the box. I don't. Know, you you pick. You go ahead. You <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, well, first, an observation about um, your comparing writing between basically Stephen King and what, what, what you do. And uh, I, I just think that writing raw fiction would be a, something a bit different as compared to writing, well, rule sets and things like that, where, which is more of a me mechanical thing where you go back and forth and tweak. So comparing like, like word count isn't maybe the a totally one-to-one -one thing that you no. can do. But I actually do have a question. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a in your games, there's, there, are, there are common elements in the rules that you use, I mean, from game to game, but, but also the games are very different. So how do you feel about the balance between like using and reusing sort of the, the, your basic core ideas and, and doing something totally different? Is there some, any like, like uh, conflict there? Or is it, do you have the urge to, to, to like, do something totally different, unlike anything you've done before? Or is, is there a, do, you, do you like, like you always using the same core and building on top of that? Well, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm just not that good of a designer uh, to just keep pulling out these um, unique ideas. Uh, I only take on ideas that I think fit into our scope, into our design ethos. Um, so, right, if you're seeing like commonalities, that's because I picked those things and said, "Hey, that'll that will work well in our sphere." Uh, Mouse Guard or Burning Empires, but I mean, you know, we have a novel design inside of Free Market. It's yeah. Free Market is completely different, uh, and um, you know, and I have other things that just haven't made it off the design table. But uh, I actually really like iterative design. I really, really like it. Uh, I feel like it's a it's a unique opportunity to go back and re-explore these designs and tweak them and modify them, and so that way, if, when I'm talking to you, we've already built a common language. And say, okay, well, it's similar to this and this and this, but here are the things that are going to be different. So I, I like that process um, yeah. in design. Yeah, I wasn't. Uh, I didn't mean this as a critique in any way. It's just an observation that. Yeah. No criticism <laughs> taken. Uh, but you're welcome to critique me. I, you know, that's what I'm here for. Uh, up there, white shirt. Two questions. Uh, first, and they both uh, come from the point when you're just starting out. Do you think it's better to self-publish or to try to find a collaborator, like say, within the gaming community that's already a publisher to come up with an idea? That's question number one. Number two, when collaborating, let's say, with artists and something like this, when you're starting from zero and you don't have much money, what do you think is the best way to approach an artist or someone that you're going to collaborate with to uh, come in and start creating uh, your work? That's great questions. Uh, there, if you're publishing a tabletop game, there's almost, I, I mean, unless you're publishing like a, a, a like a very heavily miniatures-based game with super high production values, anything less than that, there's absolutely no reason to have a publisher uh, in today's world. The between uh, payment services like PayPal, digital production, PDF, print-on-demand, uh, digital distribution, RPG Now, like all these things, uh, and the the cost of printing really isn't that high either. Uh, and with Kickstarter available for funding, there's just zero reason to ever go to a publisher. Um, and, I mean, and let me tell you quite frankly, if there was no publisher between me and MouseGuard, you guys would all have the second edition by now. MouseGuard also would not have been out of print for uh, four years. Like, that's, like, a publisher, 
will get you reach, like a publisher will take care of like, oh, you might think I'm an artist, I don't wanna deal with things like warehouses and payments and these things. Well, that, I, I think that's terrible. You're giving away your money. You're giving away control of your, your, your art. Uh, there's no reason for it. Um, you're all smart enough to do both. Uh, the, like the, especially like publishing books and things like that, the, the, the logistics side of it is minimal. It's tiny uh, compared to like actually manufacturing something. So there's no reason to have a publisher. Wait, and the second question was? Collaborating with artists. Oh, collaborating with artists. Uh, there are artists out there who also want to get their start and who want to do things and they are hungry. Find them, find them at schools, find them online, DeviantArt, for example, or there used to be this great forum called Eat Poo. Um, but, uh, and invest in a single piece of art. Find an artist that you like, negotiate a price, and get one, if it's all you can afford, one good piece of art, especially since the cost of production is so low now to, to make these things, make, uh, make a game. Um, find, you know, right, say how much for a cover or how much for like the iconic character or whatever, and, and that's all you need to get started. And then you, if, then you can use that in your demos and your demonstrations as a poster, all these things. Uh, you can use it, uh, if you run a Kickstarter, you can show that as the iconic piece of art. Um, art is incredibly important. Um, like we are a very sophisticated audience uh, in gamers. It takes a lot to get us to sit down with your, you know, with a typewritten manuscript, just a block of text. It, um, you can do it, but it's it's hard. Uh, also, working with artists is great. You get to learn that there's someone crazier than you out there, and someone who has it worse than you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I. I Jordan, um, who I, wor I work with all the time, I adore him. He's, and he loves working with me because his other jobs, also you'll find like, like you might find an artist who does editorial work or who does newspaper work, things like that, who, you know, whose rates are very, very high. But you might say, I'm doing this crazy cyberpunk sci-fi game. I really love your style. And they might say, oh, yes. Like, I don't want to do medical illustrations anymore. You know, I'll do this for you for really cheap because it's something that they just like as an artist. You find, I find this all the time. Like Jordan's rates for me, I actually talk him up. He says, how about 800? I say, how about 1,000? And <laughs> like, because he, he's so excited to work on the stuff that I give him, he'll cut his rates for me. Um, so uh, yeah, but uh, like really it just comes down to find that, find the artist you like, get one piece and build from there. Who's next? Over there. Choo. Okay, so uh, just have a question. So you're, you said that write one word at least every day, or you 306 words, or what it was. So Yo. have you written something during RopeCon, or or or, or not? Hell no. <laughs> so you, you guys are this, a this huge the distraction. Reward? What's it? What? Is it the simple reward? Reward. Yeah, yeah if, Ro Robocon is a here. complex reward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very complex. Actually, I'm not even certain if it's a reward yet. You, we'll find out on Sunday. <laughs> yep. uh, no, I, I'm not writing while I'm here, but uh, on the train up here, I pitched Topi an idea. You know, on the plane over, I uh, was making notes in here. Um, I, I had an idea for a game and one of the things I try to do with a, with a game idea, especially a role-playing game, is what is, is distill it down to what do you do in the game? What are activities that the characters do and how would the players interact with that? And just try to make a list of those things. Uh, and that's what I was doing, um, I was doing uh, on the way over here. And then I pitched Topi the general idea for the system um, and basically saw, asked him if he could think of a reason that he could just snap it over his knee. Um, but, uh, so while I'm not writing every day, I mean, obviously I don't, I, I don't literally sit down and write 306 words every day. That's my, you know, aggregate over a year, um, or over even 12 years. But, um, you know, I'm definitely working. And talking to you all, and talking to you all, like, this is the associate part of, of the process, right? Like, getting to uh, answer these questions from you really helps. It, it, it helps sharpen my ideas about my designs. Uh, it's it's very beneficial. Any other questions? Oh, right there. Hello. Hello. Uh, why do you make second editions? There are mistakes in the earlier editions. Uh, yeah, the, like I, the the Burning Wheel revised editions, like uh, the, I. 
I was really like searching for my center with the with the Burning Wheel editions, and I couldn't I couldn't quite get it until the most recent one, where I feel like that is the game that I always wanted to make it. And it's not even that like I was dreaming of this game in 2001. It's just that as I started to develop this game and as I saw what the game needed to, to be itself, um, I realized that it just wasn't quite done, wasn't quite done. It wasn't expressing itself clearly. You ask me questions on my forums, you ask me questions at conventions, and, I, and I'm thinking, well, why don't you know that answer? Like, why isn't that in the rules? So is there a way I can better clarify that? Um, sort of revise it or refine it. And then, yeah, then there are mistakes. Uh, I'm, the Mouse Guard second edition is very light, very just some tweaks. Like there are a few things in Mouse Guard that um, we call them dangly bits, where they're just like parts of the system that are kind of hanging off unused. And so I just want to prune them, make the experience better for you all. Um, I'm, oh, or, or it's a cash grab, and I'm trying to get you all to rebuy the game. <laughs> Which is the right one? I don't know. Uh, you had a question? Toss it. Long bomb. <laughs> Well, there, is, there has been uh, an argument on uh, board game community about theme versus mechanics. Oh, yeah. How about uh, role-playing games, and what's your point of view? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I play Euro games, I'm like, this could be anything. This could be any type of game. Uh, where, and in fact, there's a, um, I did a thing called Tabletop Deathmatch with Max Temkin from Cards Against Humanity last summer. It's on the internets. And this basically these people were pitching games to us and this guy pitched a, a, like a, basically a Euro resource management game and he had it tarted up as a sci-fi game. And I was like, why? I, I was so mad. I was like, why is this a sci-fi game? This could be a stock market game. This could be a game about hotels. This could be a game about anything. Like, where's the theme in this game? And he was just like, well, I just want to design a game. Uh, you know, I, so I'm, I, I, you know, theme is very important to me, but in role-playing games, we have a, this luxury. Uh, the role-playing game, uh, the tools of design in role-playing games are so dynamic, it's very easy to address the theme uh, of the game. And I, I'm not saying, like, you should ever have a stat in your game called theme uh, or anything related to it. That's not what I'm talking about, but, like, if, you know, if your if your game is you know if if it's Greg Stafford's Pendragon, uh, King Arthur Pendragon, you don't need rules for machine guns. Uh, you don't need rules for magic. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know because those are outside of the theme. Like we you know in role playing games, we have this great luxury of um, being able to really focus the games. Uh, you know, on um, you know what it is that they're after, and I and I think role-playing games are better with a theme. I think very open-ended systems and you know very generic systems, like even Fate has a theme of of pulp action adventure. Uh, so you know, I'm not saying it has to be you know emo like Vincent's games, like oh Mormon cowboy, 18-year-old virgins, <gasps> like <laughs> whatever Vincent, you have problems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it doesn't have like it can be that narrow, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, you know, Burning Wheel is a is a very expansive system, but it has a you know it has core themes underlying it. So uh, I love role playing games for that reason. And I, I mean, I've worked in electronic games and I've worked on board games. I'm you know I'm publishing a board game right now, and role playing games will always be my love for that because I can speak so directly to the players um, and you know really get you engaged in the game through the theme. Uh, what else? Uh, what, what, am I missing one? What, way up there, all right, multiple tosses. Plot your vector. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Almost. Well done, sir. So, uh, two questions. Uh, first, how did you like the expansion pack for XCOM? <laughs> and second, if you were commissioned to do a tabletop role-playing game based on XCOM, oh, you. how would you approach it and what would it be like? Yo. <laughs> All right, well, well, sir, I have a question for you. Do you want the long answer or the short answer? <laughs> well, personally, I would prefer the long answer, but I don't know if everyone in the audience is as fanatic about XCOM as the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I'm trying, I'll try to take a medium answer on the expansion pack. Yeah, um, it was all right. Uh, the, um, I, I see why they made choices that they made. So it, for those of you who don't know, in the, in the, the, they made an expansion pack for XCOM that's really weird. Uh, they didn't, they created some new missions, all this other stuff, but they basically just reset the whole game. You start at the beginning, and then you have a few other mi mission paths and some other tech trees that you build into. Like, so you, like, I, having, you know, you play the whole game and you play it multiple times, perhaps, at multiple difficulty levels, uh, some people might do. Uh, so it was very strange to me for, to, you know, to go and buy the thing and come home and put it in and be like, what? I'm, I'm a scrub again? Like, this isn't, like, part two? So I thought that was a strange, like design decision from a creative standpoint. Uh, and honestly, I felt like they did it, like, and the, the design decisions that they made throughout the game were they, them recognizing that the, the limits of their engine, and rather than fixing or adjusting, because it probably was structurally impossible to fix them, they had to add these kind of game designy elements, these like little fetch quests and bullshit like that uh, into the game in, you know, in order to, to, to fix the tactical system so you didn't just turtle or you know basically you didn't figure out the loops that the AI went into. They forced you to make these moves. And F you, XCOM, if I want to turtle, I'll turtle. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I also felt like the moral center of the game shifted when you're pretty much start off as Joseph Mengele in the beginning chopping people up and and like attaching shit to them. I was a little horrified. The, the, I felt the first game was very humane. Uh, and, and like the, 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 all the NPCs are like, this is, I don't know what the fuck we're doing, this is crazy. And in the, in the second game, like day two, you're like, cut her arms off, we'll put some metal arms on her, ha ha ha. She's still human, sure. Uh, so I was like, okay, guys. So, uh, but I mean, the actual gameplay, I gotta give them credit, like the things that they did tweak were very smooth and very nice, I like that. As far as an XCOM RPG, oh yeah. I'm your man. Are you involved? Are you, do you know 2K or anything? Because, yeah, let's talk. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think you could do it. I think it'd be fun. Um, I think uh, I think we I think Bernal headquarters could kick out an awesome XCOM RPG. But uh, yeah, I tried to talk to the Mass Effect people too. I was like, look at this. Look at what I do. God damn it, you and me. I couldn't. I can never get close. Um, we're gonna. We're trying to work out a. a partnership with the Darkest Dungeon guys on Kickstarter. Um, they did. They ran a Kickstarter campaign last summer for an, uh, a, basically a torchbearer, an electronic torchbearer, uh, which we backed it. And then we met them at PAX, and so we're going to try to do a little collaboration with those guys. That's the closest I'm getting to any of that. Um, uh, what else? Is that, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of my fantasy XCOM RPG. <laughs> we can talk later. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions over there? Is it? The young lady right there. Toss it. Okay. So you work on a project uh, for several years every day. How do you avoid burning yourself out? Uh, I don't. I'm very <laughs> burned out. Um, one thing that I ne never, I always promise myself that I'll do is, um, is I'll, you know, I'll go on vacation after I finish, or I'll do this and this, but there's never any time, I never do it. It's okay, you can leave, it's fine, I, I'd leave too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, honestly, the, like, I just love what I do so much that um, I, uh, like, it sustains me for a long time. But actually, if you look at my, my chart, <laughs> this is, I guess, a testament to my obsessive insanity. <laughs> Uh, we there's a so come on, come on, come on. So if you look, you can see a gap. There's a gap in there, uh, and so it took me about ten years to burn out uh, in 2012. Uh, where I just I could, I couldn't produce a book. I had promised myself one of my goals. Starting off, once I, once I did this madness, I said, oh, okay, I'll just do a book a year for the rest of my life. That's sustainable, right? <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, so in 2012, I just, I had to take a break. Ironically, in 2012, what I actually did, I didn't, I didn't realize this until I, until I put this presentation together. Toby, do you remember what I was doing in 2012? I didn't because I blanked it out of my memory as I was doing the layout for this game called Tenra Bancho Zero, which was a Japanese RPG that had been translated into English. And uh, beautiful game, 
gorgeous art, but you know what happens when you translate a role-playing game into English? It just balloons, oh my fucking God. It's this like beautiful 270 page like manga in its original form, and the final form is two books. Is two like 300 page books because it just, like the text, anyway, it was a fucking four year fucking layout project. Four fucking years, and, and the height of it was in 2012. So even though I was burned out and not producing a book, I was still uh, working on insanity. I also, some dead ends. Oh, uh, we were also playtesting Torchbearer that year, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and we were playtesting other stuff. That's right, that we're, we got shut down. Um, so, yeah, I, like, you got to find what your limits are. Like, one, one of my friends said to me, and who was a really good friend of mine, and he, and he said, if I do 10% of what you're doing, I'm going to be really happy. And, th and that's totally cool. Uh, you know, he has a family and a job, and, uh, you know, I don't have any kids, so these, these are my children. Um, but, like, one of, the, one of the things I learned from talking to Ron Edwards and Vincent Baker and Paul Sega, like all the, the indie RPG guys, is that, you know, you kind of, like when you're doing this stuff, you make your own piece with it, uh, and you find what it means to you to create a game and to publish. Like you don't, like that's the part of what I'm trying to say here is fuck Stephen King, fuck being a horror, <laughs> writing 2,000 words a day. Just you know, uh, this is what I do, but you need to find what you do, um, and you know, make the games or write or or whatever in, in the way that satisfies you, at the pace that satisfies you. Um, you know, I, these are just some helpful tips for actually, you know finishing it up when you're, you know, in the home stretch. Is that helpful? Uh, any other questions? Is it time for lunch? Going once? Yes? You don't, okay, you, okay, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all.